Hello, and welcome back to A Gross of Physics. This is day nine, where we're going to discuss the problem solving techniques. Now, every time we deal with a problem, we're trying to find a solution to that problem. In physics, there's often a specific solution that is available. There's usually one answer that is acceptable. As we move forward to physics where there may not be an example of an accepted answer, there may be multiple answers that are acceptable. Um, in our beginning course, though, most of the problems can be solved, most of the problems do have an answer, and most of the problems have a, um, a typical path with which to solve the problem efficiently. Now, I would like to give each one of you a procedure to follow for problem solving in general. Now, this will not apply to every problem. These steps may not be appropriate for each uh, solution you look for throughout the course. There may be some problems that are much simpler than others. But generally, if you are stuck on a problem, it's important to go through all these steps before you uh, seek assistance. Um, when you're working in groups, it's important to follow these steps together and that will become part of your problem solving uh, ritual, if you will. You'll have your own techniques that you'll develop. You'll have your own way of solving problems. As we um, move forward, you may have a certain way that you draw diagrams, certain symbols that you use, um, certain equations that you look for first. Now at this point in the course, we only have five equations, so it shouldn't be all that difficult to find the one that is appropriate for each problem. But it's important to realize that as we move forward through the course, it's going to be important to understand what topic we're talking about at any given moment, and then that will limit the number of equations that we can use. We're dealing with mechanics, so it's the description of motion at this point for kinematics, and eventually we'll get into dynamics, which is why things move. But for now, let's look at what steps are important in order to solve a typical problem in physics. It's important that you, you start every problem with a diagram um, so you understand what's being said. Most word problems are difficult in the fact that it's hard to understand what the words may mean. A diagram or a visual representation is often um, paramount to making the problem accessible to all people. Um, it could be that the problem's worded poorly. Um, it could be that the problem uh, is a little ambiguous. Um, but if you draw a diagram and then use that diagram to solve the problem that you think you're solving, then you're going to be correct in that assumption. If the problem's poorly worded, it's not the solver's problem. It's not the solver's uh, deficiency. It's the person coming up with the question. So as we move forward, I want you to realize that Defining the problem is going to be the most important part, and a lot of times a visual representation is going to help with that. It could be that you even use props to solve a problem. You use car, toy cars, um, a toy airplane if we're doing an airplane problem, or things like that in order to represent the physical objects that we're trying to analyze. Once you're done with that, we're going to list a givens list. So all the information that you know will be listed in a chart. And what I like to do is label it givens. And I'll put all the variables that I know with their symbols and the units that are associated with them. Now, one of the things that gives away a lot of these variables is the unit that they have. If something's in meters per second, it's going to be a velocity. It could be initial, it could be final, it could be um, average. But typically, meters per second will mean velocity or possibly a speed. If it's meters per second squared, that will tell you right away it's an acceleration. You have to worry about the direction. Maybe it's positive, maybe it's negative, maybe it's north or south, but it will give you a clue as to what your variable is. One of the biggest problems in physics are what I consider to be hidden variables. That will typically be, in a word problem, things that don't have numbers associated to them. Starting from rest, stopping, things like that will be hidden variables that tell us either initial or final velocities of zero. And a lot of times the problems will um, be unsolvable until you understand the word rest or stop is in there. Dropped is another key term that we'll use later on to represent starting from rest. If I drop something, it's not moving when I let it go. So that will be a hidden variable, and that's something to watch out for in your givens list. Typically, you'll need about three 
variables in order to solve a problem, especially at this point in the course. So once you have three knowns, you can move on to the next stage, which is what you're going to find. Underneath my givens list, I'll typically write the find or what to solve. And sometimes it will be more than one thing. But I'll write a givens list and underneath write find and put the variable I'm looking for. Once you're done with that, you're going to look for the proper equation. At this point, we have equation 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And you'll choose which equation has all of the variables that you have and are looking for. Basically, you're looking for the equation that has the four variables that you already have and the one or three variables you already have and the one you're going to try to find. So that will be the ones that are listed in your givens and your find list. After you do, after you do that, you write the equation out and you substitute into the equation. The way we substitute is by putting all the variables that we know in for the symbols. So example, if we are looking for, or we have VF, we would replace VF with the number. If we have the acceleration, we would replace the acceleration with the number. But what's important to realize is that you also need the unit. When you substitute, I consider it an FSS system. Formula, substitution with units, and solution. That will give you full credit on an assessment. A lot of people do FSA, formula, substitution with unit, and answer. But I use FSS because it's from a book that I used to read or I have read by Timothy Zahn uh, called The Conqueror's Trilogy. And in that book, um, there were aliens, of course, science fiction. Um, and the aliens had what they call the FIS organ, FSS. So in, in an homage to him, I like to use FSS um, in, my, uh, in my solution. So it's F formula, S substitution with units, and then S again for solution. And it's a little different than FSA, which almost everyone else uses. Once you substitute with the units, you're going to solve for your answer. You don't have to show every intermediate step um, for full credit, but what will be important is that if you need to show intermediate steps, you can do so without fear of forgetting a unit or missing a squared or something like that. Once you substitute once with all the proper units, um, that satisfies the, the first S in the FSS requirement. Finally, you're going to find your solution and you're going to box your answer. Boxing the answer is just for the person grading your assessment to know that you know what the answer is. A lot of students use a shotgun approach when they're trying to solve problems. They put numbers and formulas and as much information as possible all over the page in different spots and hope that the grader will follow their logic. It's important to realize that most physics problems have a logical progression. Um, students who do the shotgun where they throw stuff at the page, almost like uh, finger painting all the stuff that they've heard during the unit, um, they typically don't really know how to solve a problem. Sometimes they do get it right, but it's important to show the logical progression of your thought process while you're solving problems. Make sure you label what section you're solving for. If it's section 1A, label it and then show your formula solution um, and box your answer there. Make sure your givens list is near there. As you get better at solving problems, showing all the work will be less important um, when you're just solving problems uh, casually. When you're solving problems for a formal assessment, you want to make sure that you are showing proper technique. So for now, even though some of the problems may seem too easy to use the full technique, I want you to go through the process so that you um, develop good habits for problem solving. Now, it's important to realize that you should, at the end, check to see if your answer is reasonable. If you're solving for the mass of the Earth and you get a number of 7 grams, you probably did something wrong. When we're talking about speeds, if it's bigger than 3 times 10 to the 8, which is the speed of light, you definitely did something wrong. So make sure you check your numbers and make sure that they um, are reasonable to some degree. Not every problem is going to make sense. Sometimes I make up numbers that ultimately don't make sense in the final product, but most problems should have a general realm of reasonableness. Now as far as um, the problem solving technique, I'd like to now show you a few sample problems um, to show that methodology and then we'll conclude for today. Um, this is Mr. Predwicki for Gross of Physics. I thank you.
All right, the problem we'll look at now is a supersonic jet flying at 145 meters per second, accelerating at a rate of 23.1 meters per second squared for 20 seconds. Find the final velocity of the plane. Well, although we don't really need a diagram for this one, there's our plane. And what we know is that it's moving at 145 meters per second to begin with. It also has an acceleration of 23.1 meters per second squared. So what we're going to do is start with a Givens list. All right, Givens out. And VI is 145. A is 23.1. And we want to find, whoop, and it also says there's a T for 20 seconds. We then want to find final velocity. So we're going to use VF as our symbol. Now, we have VF is our unknown. VI, A, and T are our known values. So what we need to do is find an equation that matches the variables that we have and the variable we need. And looking on the chart, equation three, is the one that fits the bill. And it's already set up so that we solve for VF. 145 plus 23.1. Make sure you include your units. 20 seconds. OK. Now to calculate this, we're going to type 145. And we're going to add that to, and I'm going to put it in parentheses, 23.1 times 20, close parentheses. Hitting equal, we get 607 meters per second. And that is how you solve that problem. All right, this next one involves an airplane again. So I'll draw my airplane. And in this case, we want to determine a certain distance so that the plane can take off at the proper speed. The plane starts at rest. And right there is our hidden variable that will allow us to have enough variables in order to solve the problem. Now, according to the problem, we're going to start at zero, and we need to reach a takeoff speed of 61 meters per second. That's going to be our final velocity. Now, of course, that's not going to be the final velocity of the plane in its entire journey through the air, but that's the final velocity of the plane on the ground. And since that's the scope of our problem, that's why we're going to use our final velocity of 61 meters per second. Now the plane has a uniform acceleration of 2.5 meters per second squared. And we're looking for, in this case, two things. We want to find how long must the run be, runway be built. So that's the distance. And also, how many seconds will it take the plane to reach takeoff speed, which is t. Now in this case, we have different variables we're looking for, so we can actually choose which one we solve for first. The t can be found using equation three. Vf equals vi plus at. We know vf is 61. We know zero is vi. We know a is 2.5 meters per second squared. And T is our unknown. So we know everything but the T. In order to solve this, I'm going to type in 61. And I'm going to divide it by 2.5. And we should get 24.4 seconds. Now we can use that value as in given for future problems. However, what I'd like to do for this one is solve for D using a different equation just in case we got the t wrong. 
Now, if I look at VF, VI, A, and D, and I go through my equation list, I'll find that equation five is the one we're going to use. We know VF, we know VI, we know A, and we can solve for D. So, at this point, we're going to plug the numbers in. point five times D now you'll notice I put the parentheses around the 61 and the reason I do that is because when I have the meters per second if I put a squared next to it like this that's gonna look like an acceleration and that may get me confused in the future so I'm gonna avoid that by putting parentheses around the variable that way I don't confuse the squared with a unit for second squared. So, in order to solve this, 61 squared in the calculator, I'm going to hit equal at this point, and then going to divide by parentheses 2 times 2.5. Now I know most of us can do 2 times 2.5 in our head, but in this case I'm going to plug in all the numbers. I'm going to hit divide, and I get 744. 0.2 meters. If I were to use the T, I could have found D using maybe equation 4, for example. D equals VIT plus 1 half AT squared. And I should be able to get the same answer for D. Because of the different equations and how we round slightly differently, we may find that our answers are a little off from one another. But typically, no matter what equations you use, you should end up with the same results. So that's how we find a multivariable problem where we're looking for more than one thing.